вільні народи незалежної України. І цим все сказано. Всього чотири слова, але як багато стоїть за ними сьогодні. На 182-й день повномасштабної війни. Скільки у цих словах символів і сенсів, подвигів і втрат, радості і болю. А головне, скільки у них правди. Нашої правди. Правди про наше сьогодення, з якою неможливо сперечатись, бо неможливо не бачити і не визнавати. Ми вільний народ незалежної України. Через шість місяців, як нас намагаються знищити, ми вільний народ незалежної України. І це правда про наше майбутнє. Вільний народ незалежної України. Півроку тому Росія оголосила нам війну. 24 лютого вся Україна почула вибухи і постріли. І 24 серпня не мала почути слів з Днем Незалежності. 24 лютого нам казали, у вас немає шансів. 24 серпня ми кажемо, з Днем Незалежності Україно. Український народ та його мужність надихнула увесь світ, дала людству нову надію, що справедливість не покинула наш цинічний світ остаточно. І у ньому все ще перемагає не сила, а правда. Не гроші, а цінності. Не нафта, а люди. Шановні народи, ми завжди віддавали шану всім борцям за незалежність. Називали цей день головним святом. А синьо-жовтий прапор святиною. Прикладали руку до серця, співаючи гімн. Гордо промовляли «Слава Україні!» і «Героям слава!» Нова нація, яка з'явилась на світ 24 лютого о 4 ранку. Не народилась, а відродилась нація, яка не плакала, не кричала, не злякалась, не втікла, не здалась і не забула. Ворог думав, ми зустрінемо квітами і шампанським. Натомість отримав вінки і коктейлі Молотова. Чекав на овації, а чує хлопки. Окупант вірив, що за кілька днів пройде парадом у центрі нашої столиці. Сьогодні на Хрещатику можна побачити цей парад. Доказ, що ворожа техніка може з'явитись в центрі Києва тільки у такому вигляді. Спалена, зруйнована і знищена. Нам не важливо, яка у вас армія. Нам важливо, яка у нас земля. Ми будемо битись за неї до кінця. Не хочете, аби ваші солдати гинули. Звільніть наші землі. Не хочете, аби ваші матері плакали. Звільніть наші землі. Ось такі прості і зрозумілі наші умови. Вільні народи незалежної України. Ми зустрічаємо цей день у різних місцях. Хтось в окопах і бліндажах, у танках і БМП, на морі і у повітрі. Б'ється за незалежність на передовій. Хтось в дорозі, у авто, вантажівках і потягах б'ється за незалежність доставляючи необхідно тим, хто на передовій. А хтось у смартфоні чи за комп'ютером і теж б'ється за незалежність, збираючи кошти, щоб тим, хто в дорозі було, що вести тим, хто на передовій. Ми зустрічаємо цей день у різних обставинах, умовах і навіть різних часових поясах, але з єдиною метою – збереження незалежності та перемога України. Ми об'єдналися. З Днем Незалежності Україно! Слава Україні! When I run, I feel like I'm flying. I feel my body in a rhythm. And everything disappears. All I can hear is my heart beating. But there is so much more to running that lies beneath the surface, literally. And it's through this movement that we can see just how incredible the human body really is. There's a theory that in order to keep the human body as comfortable as possible, the brain limits physical exercise, especially when it comes to running. I always tell people to ignore the first three miles because whatever you're experiencing is trying to tell you to stop. And if you were to listen to that, you wouldn't get very far. So for me, the first three miles are just kind of whatever. And then it gets really good after that. That's Zach Friedley. He's a professional trail runner. In addition to training his body, he also spends a lot of time training his mind by meditating. Research shows that runners who are able to regulate their brain and emotions are able to push their body faster and farther. But what's happening inside the body anyways? The 
whole body is acting as a shock absorber. The muscles and tendons and ligaments and bone that are all tissues that are absorbing some of that shock. Alina Grabowski studies the biomechanics of human locomotion across many body types. For running at kind of a moderate speed, the impacts are about probably two times body weight. And then as you run faster and faster, you generate more and more force on the ground. Helping counteract a lot of that force on the ground are the calf muscles. These players help push the body up and off the ground. For other runners, this force can be neutralized through a prosthetic known as a blade. So I got my first blade back in 2007 in December, six months before the 2008 uh, Beijing Paralympics and it was one of the coolest experiences of my life. And they put that thing on me and within several minutes I was flying up and down this hallway. My biomechanics allowed me to literally fly. For biological legs, above the knee are the thigh muscles. The hamstring and quadricep muscles work together to extend and flex the lower leg. And playing defense against gravity are the largest teammates, the glute muscles. So if you didn't have a glute muscle, all of a sudden, your whole upper body would just shift forward and kind of collapse. Basically, as an above knee runner, I don't have a knee that engages my quad or my hamstring, and I don't have a calf. So my running actually comes from my right glute and my hip. So you're swinging that through, and you're really relying on those muscles to fire. And while the lower body tackles a lot of force, the arms and core aren't exactly on the bench. Studies show that actually moving the arms while running can save up to 13% of energy in comparison to stationary arms. And that extra juice is crucial in keeping the other players going, especially the MVP, the heart. They don't call it a cardio sport for nothing. During a run, the body needs up to four times the normal cardiac output in order to power all of the components on the field. The pumping of blood and nutrients can create enough pressure to squirt blood up to 30 feet. Interestingly, we found in doing research on a fair number of people with below the knee amputations that their metabolic cost or the effort that's required to run at a given speed is about the same as runners with biological legs. Within the Olympic committees, it's been thought that runners with prosthetics had a racing advantage since a prosthetic weighs less than a biological leg. But Alina's studies have shown prosthetics offer no competitive advantage. I mean, that was huge when that came out in the prosthetics world. You know, because somebody saying it's an advantage is really kind of mind-blowing that missing a limb is an advantage. I think they just don't know. You know, they see like maybe a carbon plate in a shoe and that's an advantage, you know, or how those are outlawed for like marathons, for the world records. So for me, it's just to have a, like an opportunity to educate somebody of what is actually going on. And while athletes might use their bodies in different ways during a run, all of those muscles and players are still being coached by the captain, the mind. The experience of running for everybody is different, but I feel like what connects us all is maybe we like working through challenges and we get to work through these challenges of moving our body, whether it be road marathons or sky running or these ultra distances, we're all working through these challenges and then we get to apply that to our everyday life. This just goes to show how no matter the body's physical makeup, a runner's body is a body that runs. And for that split second, when both feet are in the air, runners can appreciate just how remarkable the body in motion really is. Every player has their part to work together to create the most extraordinary team possible. People are starting to realize that if we can't find a way to pull carbon out of the atmosphere quickly enough, then solar geoengineering would be the only option in the fight against climate change. This is possibly the first technology that would be truly global and that whoever chose to use it would be affecting everyone else on the planet. This is not a technology that people want to use. The number one thing we need to do if we are really to address climate change is to reduce emissions. But I think to try to keep it in a lockbox, that's not fair. Solar geoengineering is a global issue and people have the right to understand it and weigh in. In the UN climate talks in Paris, the world agreed to try to keep warming below 2 Celsius, above the pre-industrial level. But as things stand, we're emitting CO2 so quickly, we're heading towards more than 3 Celsius of warming. And that's if every nation makes every promise that they made in Paris. We know we've got to cut emissions as fast as we possibly can, but 
just cutting emissions might not be enough. Solar geoengineering refers to the idea that you could reflect a very small fraction of sunlight back into space to offset some but not all of the impacts of climate change. We know if we reflect sunlight back to space, we will cool global average temperatures. We see this in a lot of natural examples, including when volcanoes erupt. So the leading idea for doing solar geoengineering is spraying millions of tons of slightly reflective aerosol particles into the upper atmosphere. We start with laboratory experiments where we try to replicate the stratosphere, but you can never be 100% sure that your lab system, this little tube in a lab, reflects the entire complexity of what you're looking at in the Earth system. So we have to test it in the real world. The goal of SCOPEX is to better understand the impact of putting calcium carbonate into the stratosphere. SCOPEX is a very small-scale experiment. It would pose no physical harms in terms of its potential impacts on humans or ecosystem. The idea is we would take a stratospheric balloon that would release a very, very small amount of calcium carbonate, less than two kilograms. This plume of particles creates an outdoor test tube, if you will. Then the balloon will turn around and zigzag back through those particles, taking samples, trying to understand how are these particles dispersing? How are they reacting with other particles in the stratosphere? We'll come back down to the ground and the scientists will analyze those results. There's a risk in doing this research. There is some aspect of giving this idea legitimacy. My concern is that humanity may maneuver itself into a situation where suddenly people decide, well, the only thing left we have to do is geoengineering. I think there needs to be some research to get a better understanding of what the risks are, because this decision will be made whether we have done research on it or not. One of the most serious potential risks of solar geoengineering is termination shock. If we were to use solar geoengineering to suppress global temperatures, but we didn't do anything about CO2 emissions, and if for some reason you were to stop suddenly all of the solar geoengineering, then those temperatures would suddenly spike back up, and that would mean that human and natural systems had less time to adapt to the new conditions. Fundamentally, the Earth system is a highly complex system. The questions become, what does it do to the other climate variables that we care about? That's why we need research. Solar geoengineering could be really helpful in the fight against climate change. At this stage, we just need to understand it better. The first time I used SNAP, it was a vulnerability I had at first. Um, providing for myself or my family was an important thing. There was a stigma like I was kind of reverting back to the dependency of needing food. It could be seen as a failing to not, mm. you know, be able to put all the food on the table without any help. When you see a, a person who is an active father, who's active in the community, who still works, and so you still take care of your business. However, things don't always work out the way you want them to. Life happens, and uh, you can't plan for some things. It's okay to ask for help when you need it. Your dad had to have emergency surgery. He wasn't employed at that time because of his illness, and we didn't have enough money for the surgery. So when we applied for help to pay for that, they also signed us up for food stamps. No one really wants to be on assistance. You know, you want to be able to do this yourself. I was raised in a middle class family and you pull up yourself by your bootstraps and you keep going. So it was very demoralizing, I think, and embarrassing. There was a lot of stigma around it. Where do you hope to see us in five years then? I hope that we'd be off food stamps, <laughs> that I would have full-time employment that would keep a roof over our head and be able to afford our food. I remember when we had paper food stamps and I would help my mom shop because I was like, she worked 
full time and usually jobs afterwards. So just, you know, learning at a young age how to shop on a budget with a little bit of money that we had. In terms of like our growing up stories, how healthy were we? We would eat, but it might have been just bread, just noodles, or a can of green beans. Just something, whatever we could eat in the cupboard. I remember my brother just eating ketchup because that's all we had. I mean, we ate something, but it was just the bare minimum of what was there. Hey, like, you know, we grew up in these kind of neighborhoods and we went through these things and, like, now we can hopefully, like, change some policies because food's the most basic thing. bread bags, there's tortilla bags, there's bubble wrap, there's um, grocery bags, there's fruit produce bags, but all this type of soft plastic, uh, we're taking it and, you know, repurposing it. I mean, this is the classic any bag and this uses 95 single-use plastic bags or two pounds of plastic depending on the weight and the density. This is the first bag that we launched about a year ago and we are in my factory in the heart of New York City and we've been here for 40 years. And I'm going to show you how we do the any bag. One night I was taking out my garbage, my trash, and I turned around and I said, you know, what's, what's happening with this? Where is it going? And I started thinking about the other eight and a half million people that live in New York City, and that just blew my mind. Uh, we're predominantly leather bag makers, leather manufacturers of accessories, trims, components. So we are artisans at heart. We are luxury designers, luxury makers. And from that skill and that trade that I've been around all my life, I came up with this idea of why not taking plastic and manipulating it and transforming it into something better. We'll start to prepare all the plastic by sorting by size, by weight, by density, and then we just heat seal it from end to end, making one long continuous sheet. And then we'll strip that down in two and a half inch to three inch strips, sometimes one inch strips, depending on the density of the plastic. And that is what gives us almost like a, a long plastic yarn. And this is where we weave all the plastic. This is no different than any other loom that use, that, that's used for any other textile, from cotton to denim, um, to making woven leather. It's just we took it, manipulated it, rigged the machine to work with the plastic. So once it's completely woven, we take it off the loom, and this is what you get. Almost a mosaic, if you want, of using all the different types of plastic, creating a one-of-a-kind look. Growing up in school for myself, it was the three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle. But now when you actually dissect that, there's so much more to that, and it's actually, reuse, reduce, reuse, recycle isn't really the end-all be-all. There's so much more to it. Just because it's you, you know, against the world, doesn't mean you know, what you're doing won't leave an impact. Every little thing we do is a big impact, is a step in the right direction. a good awakening again. The powwow and life on the floor does not begin until the first beat of the drum. The drum is the heartbeat of Mother Earth. She gives us life, she provides food for us, and we are always always thankful when we come to the floor that we say thank you thank you for healing me thank you for bringing me out of my depression thank you for raising me up to enjoy life again <laughs> It 
have to know that our Mother Earth is a giver of life. And to feel, have them feel the drum reverberating across into their bodies. As you dance out there, you can feel that drum is in time with your heartbeat. And that is the heartbeat of Mother Earth. Victor Green was a postal worker from Harlem, New York, one of the fastest growing African-American communities in the country. But even in his own neighborhood, African-Americans were unwelcome at many hotels and other establishments. And at Harlem's famed nightclubs such as the Cotton Club, where top black entertainers like Lena Horne and Duke Ellington packed the house every night, blacks were not allowed to sit in the audience. In 1936, Green created and published the first Negro Motorist Green Book, which listed businesses where black customers were welcome. The idea of the Green Book is to give the Negro traveler information that will keep him from running into difficulties, embarrassments, and to make his trips more enjoyable. The Green Book started out only listing locations in New York, mainly in Harlem. Two of the most prominent were the Hotel Teresa and the YMCA, which served as one of Harlem's most important recreational and cultural centers. During the 1930s, dancers from the Cotton Club rehearsed at the YMCA. And many famous luminaries, such as writer Langston Hughes and boxer Joe Lewis, stayed there. But the Green Book would soon outgrow Harlem. And by the time it ended publication, it had become more than just a travel guide. It had become a roadmap to some of the most significant people, successful businesses, and most important political milestones of the 20th century. It's important to have everyone in this nation examine the significance of the Green Book. If you don't see the history, if you don't see where it was, how can you say it happened? Eventually, the Green Book would list more than 9,500 places between its pages. Today, only about a third of those sites are still standing. We need to find those places, and we need to see them, and we need to revere what they meant, because they made all of the difference to our survival. Carry your Green Book with you. You may need it. The James Webb Space Telescope released a stunning image of the Cartwheel Galaxy. It shows what appears to be the aftermath of a cosmic hit and run. The galaxy was once most likely a spiral, much like our home galaxy, the Milky Way. But something, probably a small, compact galaxy, smacked it dead on, sending out a powerful shock wave that obliterated its spiral structure and set off a wave of star formation that continues to this day. The result is a dramatic example of destructive creation. The car wheel is located about 440 million light years away in the constellation Sculptor. It's about 150,000 light years in diameter, so a little bit larger than the Milky Way. It was discovered by Fritz Zwicky back in 1941. Even though he never had images as sharp as Hubble's or Webb's, Zwicky described the cartwheel as having one of the most complicated structures awaiting its explanation on the basis of stellar dynamics. In other words, he wanted to know just what the hell happened to this galaxy. He wasn't alone, of course. Lots of astronomers have been wondering the same thing. And that's why the cartwheel has been observed extensively, and not just in visible light, but in X-rays, ultraviolet, and even in the infrared with the Spitzer telescope. But being a small telescope, it was hard for Spitzer to get a really good look at the interior of the cartwheel. So composite images like this have varying levels of detail, and we can see that there's still some information that's being hidden by all of the dust that was stirred up in the galaxy. But now with Webb, we can see through much of the intervening dust at high resolution. 
Now we can see individual stars and star-forming regions in incredible detail. This image is a composite of Webb's near-infrared camera and its mid-infrared instrument. The colors were chosen such that the shorter wavelengths are blue and the longer wavelengths are red. So together they give us like a pink rosé cartwheel because of the colors that the imaging team just happened to use. But if we consider the images from the two instruments separately, we can begin to see different structures within the galaxy. NearCam shows us where the stars, the star-forming regions, and star clusters are located, while MIRI shows the cooler dust lanes and how they make up the overall structure of the galaxy. And notice that in the MIRI image, the colors were once again remapped to bring blue into the shorter end of the mid-infrared spectrum. The cartwheel's weird shape makes it a rare type of galaxy called a ring galaxy. It's thought that ring galaxies, like the cartwheel, used to be a flat spiral disk galaxy that underwent a head-on or nearly head-on collision with a smaller compact galaxy. The collision sends out a shockwave that rips through the galaxy, setting off a tsunami of star formation. Since the shockwave expands radially, the result is a giant ring of newly formed stars. The impact creates a shockwave that expands outward at a fairly constant speed of 120 kilometers per second. This is what forms the main ring. But the impact also creates a vertical structure that's kind of reminiscent of the way water rises after an impact. In a way, the nuclear region ends up getting displaced vertically from the main ring. Meanwhile, the ring is expanding outward, creating new stars along the way. But the ring doesn't last all that long. Most of the star formation in the ring takes place during just the first 100 million years. After 110 million years, the ring is barely noticeable. But as the ring passes by, clumps of gas flow through the spokes down to the nuclear region, where it kicks off a second wave of star formation in the inner ring. The cartwheel is a beautiful mess, but it's also a laboratory for understanding the dynamics of galaxy interactions, star formation, and stellar motions on the largest scales. And now with Webb, we can study the flow of matter within these colliding galaxies like never before. Delhi continues to reel under a heat wave as temperatures touch 45 degrees. Instant relief, गर्मी से सब फोड़ा वड़ा निकला इसको देखो गर्मी बहुत ज्यादा है कैसे कैसे करके यानी दिन निकल जाता है और जब शाम होती है तो शाम को तो और ज्यादा गर्मी लगती है तो हवा आती नहीं रात को भी नींद नहीं आती धाबे पर भी हमको यानी बहुत तकलीफ होती है उसके बाद में आपको एक बताती हूँ की जिस तरह की आपके कंडीशन थी उससे भी दस गुना मेरी तो खराब परिस्थिति है तो उन्होंने फिर व्हाइट पेन का सजेशन दिया समझ लो ये दस फुट ये और दस फुट वो और लंबाई उसकी पच्चीस है तो उसको व्हाइट पेंट ढाबे पे लगवाने का है 
तो लगभग नहीं नहीं तो चार से पाँच डब्बे तो हो ही जाएंगे पाँच पाँच किलो वाले गर्मी यानी मैं थोड़ी देरी बैठी पर मुझे बहुत ज़्यादा उस घर में गर्मी बहुत ज़्यादा लगी जैसे पहले तो इतनी गर्मी लेते थे पांच मिनट भी अपने घर में बैठ नहीं सकते थे लेकिन अभी इतना सुकून मिल रहा है ना ठंडक बहुत अच्छी लग रही है आज ये मेरा छोटा बाबू भी सो गया घर में सुकून से नहीं तो घर में एक मिनट नहीं रुकता है लेकिन आज सो गया बैठ पे आराम से Archaeologists have found something significant out in the Alkali Flats of the Utah Test and Training Range. And it's a step toward a better understanding of life here in Utah long, long ago. New Specialist Andrew Adams is live now with more on this story. Andrew, this is a fascinating one. It is, Mike, and it's literally a step. Footsteps that predate Utah's pioneers by thousands and thousands of years. It was a surprise discovery in the West Desert. I looked out the window and... Lo and behold, he goes, those are tracks. Scientists already on the way to another mission at the Utah Test and Training Range stumbled across something massive. And we found about 88 footprints um, mixed of adults and children. It's the only the second site here in the U.S. that you we've identified footprints, especially of this age, which date to the Paleo and Indian period to about 12,000 years ago. Um, is what the evidence is demonstrating right now. Cultural resource manager Anya Kitterman says it's not the first significant archaeological find on the property, and it came in the middle of a pilot program using ground-penetrating radar and magnetometry to search for more artifacts. 10,000 years ago, that West Desert was a marshland. This is all part of the old riverbed delta. Today's tribal members joined scientists at the site to observe the footprints. They were able to go out and view it along with um, side by side with us and it was really special for them to find that their history is right there. Air Force officials say they will continue to study the site as they go great lengths to protect it. Everyone is fully on board in um, preserving these remains, protecting these remains, and minimizing any sort of impact we might have. They hope more answers will surface in time. We're getting more and more pieces to a puzzle to understand what this culture was and who these people were. White Sands National Park in New Mexico is the only other place where human footprints have been found from that era. And as we mentioned, there have been other archaeological finds out of the UTTR, including a fire pit that dates back 12,300 years. Yeah, the whole thing is incredible. Dini and I were just talking. It's hard to wrap your head around it. Uh, very fascinating. Crazy. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Andrew. Isn't that amazing?